Whoever's speaking is muted. <laughs> Whoever's speaking is muted. It's me. I got it. So here's the deal. Emily, can you unmute people from your end or only invite people to unmute? Okay. So a couple of logistical things. First, welcome to Tell Me Another Live and Learn, a, an online benefit for Charter Oak State College. Um, Zoom has made things a little more complicated. It used to be the host could unmute people and the host could unmute everyone. The host can no longer unmute everyone. You have to unmute yourselves. You have the ability to unmute yourself at any time. Please don't do that unless it's your turn to tell a story or we're in between stories. When the storyteller ends his or her story, you'll know because he or she will say thank you. And then you can, let me back that up. You'll know when the storyteller is done telling a story because they, we don't say, I'm not saying he or she so much anymore. They will say, thank you. And then you can unmute yourself and clap. And that will be very rewarding. And the storyteller will be very grateful. Please don't unmute yourself other times. Um, that said, here we go. Um, a few thank yous to kick us off tonight. Thanks for Charter Oak State College for inviting me, Terry Wolfish Cole, of Tell Me Another to be here tonight. We'll talk more about Tell Me Another later. But to start with, I want to say thank you to attorney Tony Sheffy, who is helping make this evening possible. The law firm of Sheffy, Mazzucaro, DePaolo, and Denigris. De Hopefully I did that part right. Um, the Charter Oak State College Foundation is also helping us be here tonight. To you for coming. You could be watching 60 Minutes, although at this particular moment in American history, I don't know why you would do that to yourself. But you could be doing anything. You could be out for ice cream. And here you are. Thank you to our storytellers. Every time I do a show, it's really important to me to say thank you. Your storytellers tonight are going to be sharing of themselves and telling you true things that have happened to them, sometimes at the cost of their own pride. So thank you, storytellers, for being here and doing this with us. So why are we here tonight? We're here on behalf of Charter Oak State College. Here's some notes they gave me, so this part I'm reading. Charter Oak is Connecticut's only public online college offering non-traditional students over 350 online courses that lead to career enhancing undergraduate and graduate degrees. Tonight, we wanna to particularly highlight the Charter Oak Women in Transition program. This program has worked to level equity issues through higher education for over 20 years by providing a holistic approach to degree completion for single mothers in low paying jobs at or below the poverty level. Charter Oak's online format eliminates transportation issues and childcare concerns for mothers who participate in the program and allows mothers the freedom to earn their degree from the convenience and comfort of home. By removing barriers to education, the program not only improves the lives of mothers, but of their children and families as well. As well. If you've never thought about this, I am just going to stand here and tell you, if you can't cover your kids, you can't do anything. So by making it possible for these women to study at home and taking child care out of the equation, it gives women who are living on the margins an opportunity. You know, everybody talks about people pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. You can't do that if you can't buy any boots because you can't get a babysitter to go to the store. The women's program is funded by donations and grants to reduce the need for out-of-pocket costs so that mothers can earn their degrees and start their new career without burdensome debt please help us tonight. The show is free, but we are asking you to dig deep, make a donation to this life-changing program. Emily is putting in the chat on the Zoom and in the comments on the live streams, a link to find out how you can change a life tonight. Gifts of any size are appreciated. You don't have to make it big. You just got to help. Um, we will also put into the chat and the comments the website for Tell Me Another. Um, by attending tonight's event, you are consenting to receive email from Charter Oak State College and Tell Me Another. You can always opt out, but you have opted in whether you know it or not. Okay. 
I asked, um, I asked our friends tonight who are telling us stories a little bit about living and learning. I like to give everyone a chance to tell them a little, tell you a little more about themselves. So the question that I asked our storytellers was, what's something that you kind of do differently than anybody else? And by the time you realized maybe that was a little different, it was kind of too late to change. So our first friend is Barbara Sperber, who says, I had a friend in college who was terrified of driving over long bridges. Singing or screaming loudly would help her. I had no such fear, but I would join her vocally. So now whenever I drive over long bridges, I still sing loudly. And with that, our first storyteller of the evening, Barbara Sperber. Thank you, Terry. It's 1974, August. I am at the School of Social Work, the administration building, the registrar's office. In my arms is my son, a perfect child. In front of me is a long counter. Behind the counter is a woman who looks so tired, so bored. I'm excited. I tell her I want an application for admissions to the school. She sighs turns around to get the material. And I say, wait, wait, I'm only interested in the evening program. She turns around and sighs again and says, there is no evening program. In my mind, I scream, what? I hear a giggle. I look up and I see the woman behind the counter. She doesn't look so bored anymore. She doesn't look so tired. She looks alert, maybe even alarmed. I realize Probably my dismay was not as silent as I thought. I hear my giggling son and I look down and he is smiling. It takes me back to the first time I saw his face. He was a perfect child. The nurse put him in my arms and I was in unmitigated bliss for a full three and a half minutes. And then I began to worry. Worry is part of my family heritage. What if he gets sick? What if he falls? Oh God, what if I drop him? What if I'm not going to be a good mother? Nervously, very nervously, I take my perfect child home and begin a very intense, intimate relationship with the pediatrician, a very kind, patient man who I speak to every morning at seven o'clock by phone. He has calling hours. At night, I lay in bed and count on my fingers, literally count on my fingers, how many hours there are till seven o'clock and I can speak to him. There is no doubt that I am the first phone voice he hears weekdays, mornings. And there perhaps is little doubt that there are days I speak to him more than I speak to my husband. Now, at this time, it sounds very strange, but at this time, it was medically advised that nursing mothers drink alcohol while they're nursing. Now, I'm the kind of person, after a few sips of wine, I get a little tipsy, but it's medically advised, of course I'll drink, which means that for the first six months of perfect child's life, he and I were soused a good deal of the time. My son now claims that had I not imbibed so much, he would be taller and stronger and smarter and have better hair. Maybe. When perfect child is four months old, he comes down with diarrhea. I'm beside myself with concern. I am particularly upset because it's a Friday and I know in the weekend, the pediatrician is not on call. However, to my amazement, he calls me Saturday morning. I describe in great detail the contents of my son's diaper. He listens, he advises, he comforts. And then he says to me that he was not at all concerned about my son's condition. He was more concerned about my emotional state. So is my husband. A few months later, the pediatrician says to me that for the sake of not only me, but of my son, he strongly advises that I either get a job or go to school. Listen, 
It's a little daunting for a mother to be told that the best thing she can do for her child is to leave. But I'll do it. You know, just as I drank, I will do this. And he did not say, though, that I had to do this while my son was awake. So I'll do it at night. I'm not going to get a job. I need the flexibility that a job wouldn't give me in case I had to come home for emergency. I'll go to school. Fine. I don't care what I'm going to go to school for. I don't care the courses I'm taking. My only concern is that the school is just as close as possible to my house. 2.4 miles from my front door is the School of Social Work, which brings me back to the office of the registrar. And the lady behind the counter is now very friendly and helpful. And she, after hearing my story, she tells me that up the road a bit is the law school and I have evening classes. I'll go to law school. And this is how I made one of the most important and of the best decisions of my life. I didn't know, I couldn't know then that for me, good mothering is a constant stepping back, letting go so that my son, later my sons, the other one is also a perfect child, have the, have the ability to pursue their passion with minimal interference from their mother. I know the kids will probably say it wasn't so minimal, but they're wrong. I couldn't know then, as I do now, that law was a real good fit for me. I love the research, the analysis. I love the, um, most of the time, arguing in court, but I particularly loved winning. What I did know then is what I told my son as we were leaving the building. Mommy is going to be a lawyer. Thank you. That is so lovely. There's so much about that that I really love. I was much relieved at the end to hear that the second child was also a perfect child because I was afraid for the second child having to grow up, you know, hearing the first one be so perfect the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when the doctor tells you, Barbara, to have, to have a drink, I, maybe I told you this, but this is an absolutely true legend in my family. I was also the first child and my mother had terrible morning sickness and it was uh, the sixties. And the doctor told her, if you're not feeling well in the morning, sit down and have a cigarette. It will pass. <laughs> Can you imagine. Thank you for your wonderful story. I really love that. Um, coming up next, we have Carol Hall, who is our uh, Charter Oak State College rep on this event. Carol says, when I'm having pasta for dinner, I just say we're having sauce and people wonder what we're having it on, which I, I quite like that, Carol, because it reminds me of the people in New Jersey who say they're having gravy, which is so, so idiosyncratic. And with that, everybody, our friend, Carol Hall. Well, hello, and thank you. It is the late 1980s and I'm the ripe old age of 21, serving in Bermuda, in the Navy. And it was here that I learned that I was much braver than I thought I was. I grew up in a large family, an Italian family. That's where we get the sauce from. And I had six brothers and one sister. I was um, the youngest sister and also petite like my grandparents. Parents, I stretched to the height of four foot nine and a half inches tall. I'm not saying that I was spoiled because I was small, but being small had its advantages. So here in Bermuda is where I learned that I was much braver than I thought I was. Because growing up in that big house with all those people, for some reason, I grew up really afraid of the dark. But now here I am living on my own. I'm in paradise. I'm on the island where everything flourishes. The flowers grow bigger, the plants, they're big and bright and lush and beautiful. Even the toads grow bigger in Bermuda. The road toads, they were called, were round and plump, maybe the size of a small guinea pig. And when they were flattened by traffic and dried by the sun, they could be tossed like a frisbee. 
<laughs> right? But on this one night, I'm standing watch as duty tech. I'm responsible for an expansive equipment that is ex expensive and highly classified sonar and communication equipment. I'm in the duty bunk getting ready to end the night when all of a sudden Derek, my shipmate, comes in carrying two M14 rifles. There's been a breach, he says. We think there's an intruder in the building and we, you and I, have to search the equipment decks to make sure they're secure. I look up at this tall, lanky young man and I'm thinking, he looks pretty scared and nervous. And he's only an E3, he just started his naval career while I, slightly older but much smaller, am an E5. So I'm the leader, I have to lead. Did I mention they gave me a height waiver to join the Navy? And they didn't check for bravery, but here I am, I'm the leader and I have to lead my shipmate safely through this search with an M14 rifle. Now being in the Navy, we did not have weapons training in boot camp. And I only had one round on the gun range with this rifle and they didn't give us ammunition. So I'm thinking, we can do this, but hopefully there's no intruder. So the setting of the new US Naval facility in Bermuda was on top of a hill. One side faces the ocean. The other entryway is a long winding road. It's a steep road and you get to the top, there's a turnstile gate, a secure entryway. We had to know the code to get into the building. You know, the national defense of the country counted on the mission at Naval facility Bermuda. At that time it was classified, but we were observing the ocean floors for Russian submarines. We were tracking the whereabouts. It's highly sophisticated equipment. And I was the duty tech. I had to ensure the equipment was up and running, that there was no errors and that the data could be fed in from the ocean to our computers and upstairs to the analysts who were reading the data. The footprint atop the hill of, in Bermuda was very small. We went in and out the secure location. There were no windows. We did not have visitors. We didn't even have pizza delivered. But on this one night, as I mentioned, I'm facing my fear of the dark. I have to go in searching for the unknown intruder while growing up, living home with all these people. Every night I asked my younger brother to turn on the light. I would whisper, Mike, turn on the light. This meant he'd have to get out of bed and go down the long creepy hallway to turn on the upstairs bathroom light. This little bit of light, even though there's five other people sleeping in the bedrooms upstairs, this light gave me that sense of security that I needed. And here I am about to enter into the dark, looking for the hidden unknown with a kid who's more afraid than I am. I took the rifle, I strapped it on, barrel pointing forward, arm tucked in, knee slightly bent in case I'm attacked. I said, follow me, I'm gonna lead the way. So into the equipment deck we go searching. We're looking down to the left by the all the wires. No, two large rows of mainframe computers and all their perfer, peripherals are down the center. We look down the right, no intruder. Now we have to walk down the middle quietly. We didn't turn on the light, so we didn't alert the intruder. And the blinking LEDs were just a dim light on our mission, but step-by-step step, we searched, turning, jutting out that gun, looking for a hidden intruder. By the end of the equipment deck, there was no intruder. We had secured the equipment deck and made our way up the, sec the staircase, the stairwell to the second deck where the majority of the overnight staff was standing watch. When we opened the door and the light streamed out, we could see that our Shipmates were milling about, drinking coffee, talking. There was an upbeat atmosphere as we made our way over to the weapons locker to return our empty guns. And they said, there's no intruder. It was a frog, a road toad. A toad had hopped in the way and stopped the door from closing all the way. That set off the alarm and the search. And they forgot about us downstairs. So me took a leap of faith and step by step, I faced my fear of the dark and for some, this night may have just been a toad, but for me, it was a lesson in bravery. Thank you. Wonderful. Yay, very brave. Thank you. I love it. And telling a story is brave, and I know that, you know. Um, 
Our storytellers tonight, everybody, like Carol and everybody else, many came to a workshop with me. Some have tried it before. Some people are, you know, crazy in the same way that I'm crazy and they really love doing this and they can't wait to do it again. And for some people, we learn and we try and then we find out it was okay, right? Carol, it was fun. Wait, you're muted, hon. So it wasn't so bad. This was yeah. another fear I was facing. Yeah. Fear yeah. Of speaking to lots of people. Yeah. It's hard. It's nice on the Zoom because you don't always have to see everybody the whole time. That was really beautiful, Carol. I really liked it. And uh, thank, thank you. you for your service and for keeping us safe from the Russians and the toads. <laughs> um, coming up next, you guys, we have our friend Don Metcalf. Now, Dawn, I got to ask a question about this thing you do, because it says, I eat M&Ms and Skittles on equal sides of my mouth, according to color. I assume that means when you're eating M&Ms or when you're eating Skittles, you're not putting M&Ms and Skittles in your mouth at the same time, are you? No, I have to be careful of my sugar. <laughs> yeah, no, but that sounded... Like, I'm, I feel like I'm getting all drooly just thinking about M&M's and, and Skittles in my mouth at the same time. <laughs> so I'm relieved to hear this. I'm actually not a Skittles fan, but Dawn eats M&M's and Skittles on equal sides of her mouth, according yes. to the color. Right and, um, and with that, we have our friend Dawn Metcalf sharing a story. Take it away, Dawn. <laughs> One thing you should know about me, if you ask me how I am, I will tell you. And I know that's not polite here in New England when somebody asks you, how are you doing? You're supposed to say, I'm fine. But ever since like October 31st, 2000, I don't know. Okay. I'm fine. It's our first Halloween in the new house and I am incredibly excited. I am in costume, Trinity from the Matrix. I've got carved pumpkins on the front door. I've got twinkle lights in the window. We've got Buffy the Vampire Slayer playing on TV. And I have got a giant bowl of the full-sized candy bars because I want to be that house on the block. And I've got dairy-free and nut-free and preservative-free and dye-free options for anybody who's got allergies because I think everybody should feel safe on trick-or-treating. This is important to me because I grew up in the 80s when we had that razor blade in the apple scare and the cyanide lace pixie sticks rumors. So I remember taking all of our stuff to the hospital to get it x-rayed and all the homemade goodies disappeared and everything had to be individually wrapped. And then you had to show all your stuff to your parents and then lose half your stash. So it's actually important for me to feel like everybody should feel safe on Halloween. And every time that the doorbell rings, I am right there with my giant bag of goodies and the kids are sticky and sniffly and it's a little colder than I like but every time they say trick or treat or thank you they are adorable and I feel like such a grown-up. So when I start feeling a little nauseous I don't think too much about it because I've been snick snacking on like those bite-sized almond joys that nobody eats and I've lost track of how many I've had but I start to feel kind of shivery and I'm putting on extra layers and when I curl up on the couch, I'm cramping and feeling really bad. So I asked Jonathan to take over door duty and lock myself in the bathroom where I can't decide whether I'm going to sit or kneel for the next 20 minutes. So I try and do both. And John will come over and he'll knock on the door and say, how are you doing? And I'm saying, I'm fine, I'm fine. But the truth is I can't even sit up anymore. So. I peel off my costume and I get into the shower, cursing those little gremlins who have somehow given me the flu, which is a seriously poor trade-off for giant size Hershey bars. And the water is pouring on me and I'm slowly disintegrating, going from standing to kneeling, to crouching, to sitting, to lying down on the tile floor. And I can't curl up any tighter and all my insides are already out and I don't even know what to do and I'm not making sense anymore. And the knock comes across, how are you doing? And I say, I'm fine. And it occurs to me that this probably isn't the flu. And I worry that maybe it's the candy and that someone's tampered with the candy 
And oh my God, I just poisoned all the neighbor children. And I don't know their names and I don't know their parents' numbers and they could be at home throwing up and I have ruined Halloween and it's entirely my fault. And so I have to get out and I crawl literally out of the shower on my hands and knees, but I can't make it to the door and I fall onto the bath mat and I can't even move and I'm just shivering, miserable. And there's the knock at the door. Everything okay in there? And I say, I'm fine. And that is when I have the moment of clarity and almost out of body experience, looking at myself, shivering in a fetal position, in a puddle on the floor. And I think, this is not fine. And so I say, I think I need to go to the hospital. And that's good because Jonathan says, great, I've already called the ambulance. I say, okay, fine, get me my clothes. Now, I am not specific when I say get me my clothes. And so I end up in a big sweatshirt and loose pajama pants and no underwear. So when the EMTs show up, I'm totally commando. And it doesn't even matter because I'm fine. I am so fine, I walk myself down the stairs instead of getting strapped to the gurney like a normal person being loaded into an ambulance. But I do manage to say, what about the children? And an EMT turns to Jonathan and says, um, sir, is there anyone there to stay with your children? He says, we don't have children. She's delusional, don't ignore her, let's go. So after six unamusing hours, uh, three rounds of lost paperwork, twice throwing up all the contrast dye I can drink. And a full day later, I'm finally home after my emergency appendectomy. Curled up on the couch, healing. Grateful for my husband and the fact that I did not, in fact, poison an entire Costco bag full of neighbor children. So nowadays, I am more careful with my sugar and my words. So if you ask me how I'm doing, be warned, I will tell you. Because while I'll say that maybe I'm doing good, I will not say I'm fine. Thank you. That is, that is something. I'm glad you're well, Dawn. But uh, yeah, not so fine, huh? No, quite the story that. Um, thank you for sharing. And I'm Don and I have talked about this story before. I'm particularly amused at the idea of uh, competitive Halloweening, which is something that at one point in my life I totally would have done as if they would get home and go like, that house was the best house. They don't know. They just look in the back. Um, thank you for sharing, Don. I found that. Oh, Emily says, yes, we do. She says they know who have Don, so you know this. She says, they know who have the good stuff and that's the houses they want to go back to the next year. So apparently competitive Halloweening is worth investing in. Um, and we're going to get one more story and then we're going to take a little break and uh, have a drink. But our last storyteller to start us off here is Dave Calaby, our friend Dave. Dave is on the board of the foundation and is how I came to be with us tonight. Uh, thanks for that, Dave. And Dave says... Uh, the thing he does differently and can't really relearn, which makes me laugh because it's totally something I do. He says, despite living in his house for 20 years now, he still routinely hits the wrong light switch when entering the kitchen. He attributes it to a design flaw. Dave, I would like to say that my house has the same design flaw because I am forever like this one, no, this one, no, this one. And I'm here also 20 years. Uh, with that, our friend Dave Calaby. Hi, everyone. So standing in front of the fourth grade class, I'm not at all sure that I remember the words to the Pledge of Allegiance exactly correct. But now I realize we're supposed to recite it. Okay. And I was 22 at the time, which makes it a little even odder. I was the substitute teacher. A after college, I substituted back at my hometown while I was looking for a full-time job. I didn't start in grade school, though. I, I, I was first assigned to back at my high school. I, I attended high school at William H. Hall High back in the early 70s, when open classrooms and other hippiest fads were still quite the rage. In fact, we didn't have a library. We had a media center. And the uh, media center meant that it, along with books, had music, and study carols, and the study carols had these little closed circuit TVs that were used primarily by students 
to watch Sesame Street actually. Um, just despite the fact that it wasn't called a media center, it, it was called a media center, not a library. We, we had nonetheless a head librarian named Mr. O'Neill. Now the school had just been built. And so the, the media center had a new carpet. So did Mr. O'Neill and, and neither of them was a particularly natural shade. Some of us students tried to torture poor Mr. O'Neill by sporadically yelling rug when we were studying in the media center. The idea was to see who could yell rug the loudest without getting caught. No one was ever caught. If Mr. O'Neill heard us, which undoubtedly he did, he never let on. He wasn't about to be embarrassed by a bunch of nerdy high school kids, some of which would go on to need baseball caps or Rogaine to hide their own impending need for a rug. My first day as a lowly sub at Hall High, beneath the notice of most teachers, it was ironically Mr. O'Neill who welcomed me with courtesy and respect. He, he showed me to the teacher's lounge got, lounge, got me a cup of coffee, told me how to actually be a substitute teacher, and was generally kind and helpful. I, I felt really small. Um, <laughs> oh, you know, when you're a substitute teacher, no one expects much from you, certainly not the students, but not the teachers or administrators either. If they did, they, they'd insist that the absent teacher leaves a good lesson plan. You can't really teach us a substitute unless you have a good lesson plan. And if you have a bad lesson plan, it really makes things more difficult. When it says just show a movie, you, you know, it reduces you to a babysitter. The students like it, but you're ultimately going to lose control of that class. My, I had a cousin who used to be a teacher and was by then a sub herself, and she told me her advice on how to control the class. She said, when you get in the room, yell at them, whether they serve it or not. Show them who's boss. That bothered me on so many levels, not, not the least of which is the fact that I was much closer in age to them, the students, than I was to the teachers, or to even her, for that matter. When I was left a good lesson plan, it was usually a math class for some reason. And I would make sure that while I had free time, I would study the lessons so I could actually teach that class. English classes, on the other hand, it was always a lesson plan was always have them sit quietly and read. That never went well. There was one English class in particular that was so boring. The students weren't even reading. They were just kind of staring glassy eyed and I felt I had to interject, so I, I, I stopped in the class and said, Let's, what's going on here, folks? I, I learned that most of the students had been, uh, were athletes in the school and that had been recently assigned a series of short stories and plays that they found irrelevant and boring. And at the, at the time, they were actually reading Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller. I, I implored them saying, look at guys, these are some of the best stories written in the English language that the, the, while the dialogue and some of the circumstances might seem dated, that the, the messages they contain are, are continue to be relevant and, and today and as well as very insightful. I, I actually said that you guys might know people like the, the people in Death of a Salesman, especially Biff, the ex-jock who was, had a lack of success in life based on his limited education and his sense of self-entitlement. I, as the period was ending, I, I implored them to continue reading and to keep an open mind, but I think it fell on deaf ears. You know, it, you get a lot of attitude from the students in high school when you're a sub. In, in middle school, the, the students are just, you know, home, hormone trenched. But in both of those schools, you're pretty, self, you're pretty assured that one student isn't going to jump up and skip across the room and pinch a student on the other side of the classroom. In grade school, all bets are off. The, the students in Mrs. Johnson's fourth grade class had never had a male teacher before. Some of them told me they didn't even know that there were male teachers. So when the tall bearded substitute with a deep voice showed up, they were impressed. Of course, that didn't last too long. I introduced myself and started into the first lesson. And one of the little boys immediately jumped up and started waving his hand. I called on him and he explained that we were supposed to start today with the Pledge of Allegiance, 
Of course we were. How could I forget that? Of course, I, you know, you don't say the Pledge of Allegiance in college. I hadn't said the Pledge of Allegiance for years. I wasn't sure I knew all the words of the Pledge of Allegiance to lead the class. So thinking quickly, as kind of a reward, I asked him to lead the class in the Pledge of Allegiance, at which another student stomped her foot and cried out. And I found out that she was the Pledge of Allegiance monitor that week. And as a matter of fact, a lot of kids had official duties that week in the class, and it was all spelled out on a, on a poster in the back of the room, if I had only noticed. A little bit later, we're having a geography lesson, and a student gets up out of his, out of his seat and goes and checks the atlas, which I thought showed curiosity and initiative until I was informed that Mrs. Johnson had a rule against leaving your seat in the middle of a lesson. Turned out that Mrs. Johnson had a lot of rules of which I was totally unaware until I was duly, duly, fully, duly fully informed that I had allowed them to be broken. Now, Mrs. Johnson had left me a very detailed lesson plan, including things like what I should be teaching the lion reading group in the front of the class while the leopard and tiger reading groups are in the other corners and I have to try to somehow keep them occupied and motivated. But she didn't leave me a list of rules. She probably assumed that they wouldn't let someone teach fourth grade unless they knew the rules. So I allowed one rule after another to be violated until finally I had to say, look at kids, all rules are suspended for the day until, unless I set them. You know, in, in the other grades, in, in junior high and in high school, you have a set of students till the bell rings, then you get another set of students. In grade school, you have the same students all day long and you teach them all the subjects, you really don't get the, a chance to make a, you don't really don't get a second chance to make a first impression if you mess up. And it, it ended up being a, a pretty long day. I, I felt that I had done poorly until when clearing my desk, getting ready to go home, I found a note that was written by some of the students that said, Mr. Calabi, I, I uh, I really enjoyed, we really enjoyed the day. We think we learned a lot. We hope you could be our teacher again sometime. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of days later, I was back at hall, walking in the hallway and a student chased me down and said, Mr. Calabi, I, I was in your class when we talked about death of a salesman. I, I want you to know I've read it. I thought it was really good, thanks. So what did I learn by being a substitute? Well, I learned that it, it can be fulfilling being a teacher, but you gotta work for it. I learned that grade school teachers gotta work the hardest, be the most resourceful, be the most creative. And I learned that sometimes grace and goodness is hidden under a rug. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, there's Mr. O'Neill. Oh. <laughs> That's Mr. O'Neill. Dave, that's lovely. I thought it was going to be a picture of you from back then. I was kind of excited to see that, but I'm also excited to see Mr. O'Neill. That was really lovely, Dave. I quite enjoyed. Thank you very much. Um, my husband is a grade school teacher heading back in tomorrow. So cross your fingers, you guys. Wish us some luck. Um, normally, this is the moment in the show where we would be taking a break and visiting the bar, but um, we're at home. You can go to the restroom, restroom anytime you want. And instead, we're going to spend a few minutes with our friend Albert Schmidt. Albert is an alum of Charter Oak. He was awarded a Bachelor of Science from Charter Oak State College in 1997, and he is and holds a Master of Arts from the University of Adelaide. He is the author of many books, including the award-winning Kentucky Bourbon Cookbook and The Beverage Manager's Guide to Wines, Beers, and Spirits. Um, Albert, tell us about your latest book. What's that? So my newest book is uh, How to Drink Like a Rockstar, which is part of a series, How to Drink Like a Mobster, How to Drink Like a Spy, How to Drink Like a Rockstar. And then at the end of this year, it'll be How to Drink Like a Royal. So if you... Um, Fascinating. How do royals drink, Albert, except with their pinkies in the air? With their pinkies in the air, right. So a lot of gin... Um, and a lot of vermouth um, and, and a couple of other uh, spirits. So, um, but a lot of them. I don't know. 
Albert, is How to Drink Like a Rockstar currently out? We're looking for an Amazon link to put in the comments and the chat for you. Okay. Um, is is it, it there on Amazon? It is on Amazon. And it, it was actually released the same day that we were originally going to do this. Oh. So uh, I think yes. it was August 4th. Yes, this was this show the first time, in case anybody wonders, the first date that we were going to have the show I had to go to Florida and sadly say goodbye to my grandmother, 105 years she had on the earth. So that was okay. Then we rescheduled and there was a rainstorm and I was like, it's no big deal. My power's on, and but I can't reach Carol. And Dave's like, you can't reach Carol because three quarters of the state is without power. We are rescheduling. So here we are, August 4th. And Albert, what are we going to drink tonight? So tonight we're going to make an old fashioned. And it, I theorize in my book, The Old Fashioned, that this is the original cocktail. And so the original cocktail probably came into existence in Elmsford, New York, um, at a tavern owned by Betsy Flanagan. And she would steal roosters, pluck the feathers, and then use those as cocktail stirrers. Thus, the cock's tail. So... Mm -hmm. And um, also probably very important for everybody to know that uh, there was a definition in 1806 of what a cocktail was, and it was a stimulating spirit, okay, bitters, water, and sugar. And so that's basically what we're going to be doing today. We're also going to add a little bit of ice and perhaps a little bit of fruit, which is optional. Brilliant. Course. Rock on, Albert. Show us. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, this is called an old fashioned glass. So it's nice and squatty. You can have that. I'm going to go ahead and add some sugar and a, a teaspoon will do it. You don't need very much. I also have a little bit of water and so a teaspoon of that and you can sort of mix it around. I've got a, a squeeze of orange. And if you have a muddler, you can go ahead and muddle it too. Now, the great thing about these, um, when you do this, you wanna make sure that you just muddle the fruit and not uh, the, the pith. The pith is the white part, it's very bitter. Okay. Um, once you've done that, um, you add a little bit of bitters. So I've got two different types of bitters. The recipe that we gave you ahead of time had Angostura bitters. I also like Peychaud's bitters. Um, I lived in New Orleans for an extended period of time and uh, a drink is not a drink without that type of bitters. Albert, what exactly are bitters other than magic that I put in my glass? What is that magic? It's kind of like salt and pepper. Um, okay. so it's seasoning for drinks and it's made out of alcohol. Uh, it's a very high level of alcohol, but it is extremely bitter. So this would be a non-potable alcohol. So you can't drink it by itself. Can I make my own bitters if I get ambitious? Absolutely, you can. Interesting, I will investigate. So the, the best thing to do is get some vodka mm -hmm. and um, and then add whatever you'd like to the bitters. Uh, mm -hmm. Orange peel is really good. And mm -hmm. the vodka will take on that flavor. Okay, thank so, you. So I've added all of that. And so now I've got my bourbon and I'm gonna go ahead and add two ounces. Now I'm adding bourbon, but that does not stop you from adding rum or tequila or uh, vodka or gin, if you like it. Uh, all can be used for old fashions. So, and then I've got some ice. And then I'll just give it a real quick stir. And that's how easy it is to make an old fashioned. Delicious and lovely, Albert, thank you. I myself will be enjoying one after the show. My I'm pleasure. On the clock. But cheers, Albert Chin Chin. Cheers, thank all you. That. Look, I am, thank you. Um, a quick reminder to everybody in the audience, we're here tonight to enjoy stories and to support Charter Oaks Women in Transition program. Want to know more about the great work this project accomplishes? One recent graduate says, 
the WIT program gave me the resources and encouragement I needed to complete my bachelor's degree. And I've been so fortunate to have built a successful career with the healthcare administration degree I earned. It's been a complete game changer for my family. So please check the links or write a check tonight. Emily, are we also putting the address in the comments? Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, you can also, let's see, find out more of the Tell Me Another stuff. We've got an intro to storytelling class on Thursday evening. We've got a show, a live show in the parking lot at Hartford Flavor Company on September 11th. And another virtual show, a benefit for New Britain Roots on September 26th. Now, coming up, um, well, let's see. I am missing a page on my script. So, oh no, there it is. There we go. Okay. Coming up, we've got Emily Tucker. Emily says she is a closet adrenaline junkie who has only ever owned black cars. Interesting. Our friend, Emily Tucker. I'm standing back up. So um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, perfect. All right. I stepped out of my car. It was freezing. It was dark. It was February. For someone that loves summer and sunshine, dull winter, winter nights are not a fan favorite. I carefully walked down the driveway afraid to slip on black ice because frankly, falling on black ice is also not a fan favorite. As I walked past mounds of snow, I thought to myself, I cannot wait for winter to be over. I grabbed the doorknob of Lisa's salon full of emotions, fear, anger, shame, disappointment. I wasn't there for a regular haircut. I needed a drastic change. I had been growing out my hair for my upcoming September wedding and that was no longer happening. Just a few days earlier, Alex broke off our engagement, a scene that played over and over in my head, a scene where I took in every detail. It felt as if time just stopped. I was standing in the bathroom doorway, leaning against the white painted wood frame. When I heard Alex say, I don't love you and I'll evict you. These words were from a man who I'd been with for three years, from the man I thought I'd marry in eight short months. I froze. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. In that moment, everything changed. I stopped fighting. I gave up. I felt something inside of me and a, a whisper of my heart just saying, let go. Let go of him, let go of this life, let go of what you know. I cried, I cried and cried some more. Through the tears, I made the decision to let go and trust my life would be better, better than I could ever imagine. I had no idea what that would mean. I had no idea what that would look like. All I knew was it was going to be different. I was at Lisa's salon because I made the first decision, decision to cut it off, to have that post breakup chop. Letting go of my hair was like letting go of my identity. I loved my long blonde hair. It was unsettling. It was uncomfortable. I was sad. I felt like I had to let go of everything around Alex, even my long hair. Lisa greeted me with a warm smile. She knew what was going on. She gave me this incredible hug full of love and compassion. It was one of those hugs that says without words, I care and I'm sorry. As she released me from the hug, she looked into my eyes and said, are you sure you want to do this? I said yes in a crackled voice as I took off my coat. 
I could feel myself become more and more anxious as I walked to her chair. I was ready to do this thing. Change my life. <laughs> Coco Chanel must have had the same feeling when she said, a woman who cuts her hair is about to change her life. I stared at my long blonde hair in Lisa's salon mirror as she picked up the scissors. She asked again, are you ready? I closed my eyes. I took a deep breath. I gave her a nod to start. I eagerly waited for Lisa to make that first cut. I was ready to meet the new me. I kept my eyes closed as she went in for the first cut, embracing all the nervous energy. I let out a deep exhale, feeling an immediate sense of relief. I was here. I was chopping off my hair. I was letting go. I was proud of myself in a strange way. With the second cut, I made another decision to get to know me, to dig deep, to look inward, to heal. Until this time, I had no idea who I truly was. Each new cut led to another question. What did I like? What did I not like? What brought me joy? It was amazing how much better I felt after just a few cuts. I was letting go so naturally. The next thing I heard was Lisa ask, are you ready to open your eyes? I was ready to see my new hair. A bit reluctant, but I opened my eyes. My long hair was now shoulder length, an adorable inverted bob, a look I hadn't had since third grade. I looked in the mirror. I felt pretty. I felt different. I had taken that first step. I was transforming into the new me. Thank you. I love that. I love that. It's a hard thing to do, right? To let go of how we look and forget that how we look is not who we are. It's hard. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Emily, thank you for so much for sharing. What thank a you. trauma. What a really trauma. And you made it through. I made it through. Good for you. Good for you. So it makes it stronger. <laughs> really, you know, it's true. What doesn't kill us and all that. Um, and here we have our friend, Bobby Clow, also. Um, well, I'm not going to say, but Bobby <laughs> says her interesting thing is she brushes her teeth after or she's dressed, which also I do that, Bobby. Um, and her husband doesn't understand how she doesn't get toothpaste all over herself. Um, our friend, Bobby Clow. Thank you. I, I have this feeling that we have to go out and buy a muddler. Do you think that we need to do that? <laughs> Wait, I'm trying to get the gallery view so I can see I him. have, Bobby, not just a muddler. I have that muddler. So if you want, we can <laughs> talk later muddler. and I'll tell you, oh, yeah, okay. I like it. <laughs> okay. It's good to see everybody. The stories are wonderful. Thank you all. It is the first night of Passover, 2020. All over the world, Jews ask the same question. Why is this night different from all other nights? Well, on this night in 2020, the answer is that the Jewish people learn how to Zoom. And many of us share the holiday virtually. Now, a few days before our family gathers together for our first ever online Seder, one of our sons, the organizer of the event, asks all of us to please consider two other questions. First, what are we grateful for, even as we are going through this modern day plague? And second, what are we looking forward to once it's over? Well, for me, the first question is a no brainer. My life is full of blessings. My middle initial is G for gratitude. The second question though, gives me some pause. 
I know that right up at the top of the list is hugging. Hugging our kids, our grandkids, our family, our friends, our neighbors, the mailman, whoever. I am a big hugger. My body craves social contact. But what after that, I think? I know that I look forward to a world that is healthy and healed. I know that I look forward to a country figuring out how to provide healthcare for everyone. I know that I look forward to a society and schools that are colorblind and that offer even even the, the poorest among us, the opportunity to rise from poverty to possibility. I know all of those things, but in my heart of heart, I know that what really comes right after hugging on my list of things that I'm looking forward to is shallowly, selfishly, superficially, a wash, cut, and blow dry with Sebi, my hair guy. We're talking a lot about hair tonight, guys. Now, I have a rather unusual relationship with my hair. It goes back to several years ago when I spent the better part of a year without any due to cancer and chemotherapy. So when my hair grew back in, I became attached to it. I like the way it looks. I like the way it feels. I like the sense of control that I have over it, probably because during that time that I was ill, I felt that I had lost control over everything. So Passover passes over. The days go by. The weeks go by. A month goes by. Five weeks, six weeks. My hair is getting longer and <laughs> shaggier and totally out of control. And then out of the blue, one day, my husband, David, says to me, Bobby, would you like me to try to cut your hair? I felt a knot in the pit of my stomach. Was it fear? Was it disbelief? Was it just the thought of somebody not named Subby messing with my head? my adrenaline spiked and sent a clear message to my brain. And so I turned to my husband and I said, David, that is such a wonderful offer, but are you out of your mind? A clear no. And so more time passed by, another week, seven days, 10 days, I listened to the governor's daily COVID-19 update to hear when he was going to open the beauty parlors. And then it hit me, even if he did, I wasn't going to be able to visit Subby for a long time. I am elderly. And underlying health issues? Well, I don't know of any, but who knows what could be lurking inside of me, ready to just jump out and bite me at the first ingestion of a COVID uh, droplet. And so I began to rationally think about David's offer and to reconsider it. Now, my husband spent his career as an airline pilot. He flew really, really, really big airplanes. But somehow, try as I may, I have never been able to relate that particular talent to the talent required to cut my hair. On the other hand, David is a wonderful fixer of things. He can renovate, redesign, and repair anything and everything around our house. And he's the only person that I know who can list off a thousand and one ways to enhance your life through duct tape. So based on that fact, 
and a great leap of faith, I took him up on his offer. We changed the name of our house temporarily to Sheer Terror. And I gave myself over into the hands of Mr. David. We agreed to meet the next morning in the bathroom. He approached with a razor, a comb, and a pair of scissors. I sat down. I threw a bath towel over my shoulders. I shut my eyes tight. I clenched my fists. And I said, do it. And he did it. Not quite like Subby, but good is good. And so the wonderful thing that I have learned is this. 12 days from today, Mr. David and I will celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary. I have lived with this man for 60 years and I thought I knew everything there was to know about this guy. But it took a worldwide pandemic and a leap of faith for me to discover and be the beneficiary of yet another talent of his. And to top it all off, because he's a co-owner of our home, which we have now renamed Sheer Relief, I didn't even have to tip him. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Oh my gosh. Wow. I liked when we got to sheer terror, there was much laughter here at the Cole House. <laughs> we really enjoyed that. Um, that's a beautiful story, Bobby. I love that story. Thank 60 you. years. Wow. What is, do you know, like, what is the, um, if your first anniversary is your paper anniversary and 25 is silver and 50 is gold, what is 60? Do you know? I probably knew at one time, but I'm elderly, so I forgot it. <laughs> okay, so I'll just tell you, David, it's diamonds. <laughs> ah! <laughs> that. I don't know. I made it up, Bobby. How'd I do? Uh, that's good. That's good. Diamonds are good. Oh, good. my daughter is on the Google, and she says, actually, I got it right. It is good. actually diamonds. Good. So I think you can probably mail order them from Amazon at this point <laughs> in the pandemic, and they will be here by tomorrow at noon. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. For the thought. thank you for sharing um the links for everything the donation links um information about charter oak state college what? my website www.tellmeanotherstories.com that is all in the chat for you and in the comments on the live streams um if you're on the live streams please subscribe like follow do all that kind of good stuff oh, um and yeah. i am going to close out our show so i'm going to tell Greg. you the weird my weird shameful secret the thing i do differently from other people which is i don't know how to tie my shoes like everybody else i am a two looper and not only am i a two looper but i have raised two two loopers Am I frozen? No. Do I look frozen to everybody else? Bobby Clow, can you see me? No, she says I'm good. Okay. Um, not only have I, not only do I tie my shoes with two loops, but I have raised a pair of two loopers because it was the only way I knew how to teach them. Um, so I will close out the show. And I will tell you, it's the uh, middle of the night or early in the morning, I guess, depending on your point of view, day 31 or 32 of our quarantine in a global pandemic. It's been a rough month, you guys. It's been rough on everybody in different ways. It's rough on my daughter, Emily, who had to leave her dream job when Disney World closed down and move home to her childhood bedroom. It's rough on my 18 year old son, Jonah, who watched his senior year just disintegrate and blow up. It's rough on my mother who's come up from Florida with us in a car and is now living in the guest room, living the family life and making dinner again instead of being on her own in Florida. It's rough for Andrew teaching fifth grade from the basement. And it's rough on me. 
I'm having kind of a hard time. I, this whole quarantine and being locked in at home thing is rough for me. I am someone who enjoys the company of other people. Everything that I like best in the world involves large quantities of humans breathing the same air. I like crowded bars. I like restaurants. I like concerts. I like all those things. I like my own stage show. And this is offset by a lot of time at home. I work from home by myself. Nobody else is in the house. And now I don't get the people I like out of the house and the people I do like in the house, I get them, but I get so much of them. They're there constantly and they want things and they need things and they're hungry and they leave their things all over the place. And I need a break. And on top of it all, I'm afraid about the virus. It's day 31. We don't know if we can safely bring groceries into the house. We don't know what's safe and what's not. And it's all quite terrifying. So here I am in bed with Andrew, asleep kind of. And I have this notion in my head. I roll over and I get this idea in my head that my husband is not in bed next to me. And I need to know where he is. I need to know that he's safe and that I'm safe and that we're all safe. And I reach out to touch him and reassure myself that he is where he should be. Only in my liminal state, not quite awake, not quite asleep, I don't actually gently reach out to touch my husband. What I do is smack him across the nose as hard as I can. And he wakes up with a start screaming, yelling, what in the hell is going on? He's clutching his face. And I realize suddenly what I've done. And I am so sorry. And I am apologizing and apologizing and apologizing. And Emily comes from down the hall to see what's happening, what's all the hubbub. And Jonah sleeps through the whole thing. And soon enough, we all settle down and go back to sleep. And I think that's the end of it. The next morning, I wake up before Andrew, as I often do, and I head down to the kitchen. I get my coffee, and I'm sitting at my workstation at the dining room table, settling into my day's work. There's a lot going on, and I'm kind of plugged in and focused on what's in front of me, and I'm not really paying much attention as he comes down the stairs and stands kind of in my field of vision, but I'm looking at the computer, and finally, I look up at him, and this is when I see it. The bruise is shaped like a butterfly. It covers the entire bridge of his nose and goes under both eyes. And I realize with a start that my husband's got a pair of shiners and I have anxiety punched him into a broken nose. And I am horrified by what I see and what I've done. But there's not really anything to be done about it. I, I mean, we, we speak about this briefly, and I apologize again over and over, but we're not going to the emergency room over a broken nose in COVID days. I mean, in non-COVID days, there's not much to do about a broken nose except get through it. And COVID time, we are certainly not going to the hospital. There is nothing to do but put an ice pack on it and wait it out. And as we're discussing our plans, that's when it happens. At first, when I realized the absurdity of the situation, a little giggle starts to rise up. And soon enough, it's a titter and a chortle and a guffaw. And all the words you know for laughing are happening live in my dining room as I look at my husband and his broken nose that I have caused with my anxiety about the COVID. And the tears are rolling down my face. And Emily again is awakened by all the racket and she comes down and she looks and she gasps. And then she starts to laugh and Jonah and my mother, and we're all laughing at my poor husband, this poor son of a bitch and his broken nose. And over the course of the day, as is my habit, I tell kind of everybody I know, 
Andrew watches over my shoulder as I text my girlfriend, Karen, across the street and tell her what's happened and add 17 laugh cry emojis to the text. And as I call my sister and can hardly get the words out because I'm laughing so hard about Andrew's broken nose and I put it up on Facebook and I tell everybody I know, and this goes on all day. Sometime late in the afternoon, I'm still working at the dining room and Andrew comes in and he says, can I talk to you a minute? I go like, yeah, okay, sure. What do you want? You know, he goes, no, nah, in the family room. Can I talk to you in the family room? And I go to the family room where my mom and Emily and Jonah already are. And I realize that I've been summoned to a family meeting. That's not good. And it kind of crosses my mind for the first time all day that maybe Andrew doesn't think this broken nose is quite as funny as I do. And I am fumfering, looking for the words, what am I going to say to get off the hook on this one? Like, I broke his nose and I laughed about it all damn day. How am I going to escape this and get off the hook? And while I'm trying to think about it, Andrew looks at me and goes, had a good time today? I said, well, uh, 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 he goes, thought it was funny, huh? I go, uh, uh, uh. And as I sit there speechless, which doesn't happen too often, my husband walks over to the coffee table where the tissues sit in a fancy box and he picks one up and carefully wipes the bruise away. And I realized this guy has been playing the long game. He has conned us morning till night in this house, letting us think that I broke his nose, letting us laugh at him about this, letting us laugh at myself about this. And I realize in the same moment, not only was it all a con, but he didn't just play this joke on us, my husband. He played this joke for us. The entire mood in the house has shifted. Some sort of cloud has been lifted up. And for the first time in a month, we've laughed so hard that it hurt. And I am so grateful, as I know in this moment, that quarantine-wise, things could be worse. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let me hear. I'm going to flip this over. Thank you, everybody. Um, that is the end of our show. Thank you, Albert, for our um, old-fashioned recipe. Thank you to our wonderful storytellers who have done so much to get ready over and over as we had to reschedule this show to prepare for the evening. Um, please do come see a live show sometime soon. We're, we've got this one in the parking lot, but then maybe in the spring, they'll be back for good. Come to a virtual show. Take care of Charter Oak State College. They are doing good work, our friends there, and making it possible uh, not just for people to learn stuff, but for lives to change. Um, thank you again, everybody, for being here. That's our show. I'm going to sign us off in a second and say good night. Um, stick around, talk to each other, do your thing. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Terry. That was great. Terry, that was wonderful. Here. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And thank you, especially, like I said, to our storytellers. It's a hard thing to do. And, uh, and we're really grateful. Thanks, Terry. So, good night, everybody. Good night. Good you guys are so good. Good night. Really good. That was great. Great story. Great. All the stories. Good story. Those yeah. were fun. Thank you so much. Where are Dave? We went to we went to hall together. Oh, there's the phone. Okay. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night. First story. Thanks for making it fun. I like that they were so different also. There wasn't a, you know, each story was very different. It was very- there was